A new wall goes up in Israel. This time it's in the north on the border with Lebanon. Six meter high slabs of concrete to avoid friction and protect from incoming fire. But will it protect or just further seal the country's isolation in the region? Israel and the walls that surround it. This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. A wall is either built to protect or to separate, sometimes even both. Now, in the case of Israel's new border wall with Lebanon, of which construction has just begun, it's supposed to be about protection from potential battles. But there has to be a question over whether, when it's completed, the wall will actually serve to separate Israel from its neighbours and even stoke tensions further. Here's the situation on the map, just to put you in the picture first of all. Remembering Israel already has a security wall running along the border with Lebanon. This is the so-called Blue Line, uh, a demarcation created by the United Nations. It is where the Israeli forces had to pull back to when they withdrew from Lebanon back in the year 2000. The new wall, though, it's actually very small when you see it in the context of the whole border. It'll only be a kilometre long uh, between Matala and the Lebanese village of Kfakila. Matala is Israel's northernmost outpost, surrounded by Lebanon on three sides, in fact, which perhaps tells you why Israel feels it needs extra protection there. In a moment, I'll introduce our panel for today. First, though, this report from Nisrael Shamela, who is on the ground in Matala, seeing the wall being put up. The Israeli army began the construction of a concrete wall along part of its border with Lebanon. It says in order to prevent cross-border frictions. UNIFIL, the United Nations interim force in Lebanon, installed the orange tarp on Sunday. Construction began by the Israeli army on Monday. The United Nations Disengagement Observer Force Zone worked with the Israeli army in order to determine the exact location of the concrete wall and to make sure that it would only be built within Israeli territory. Even though Israel and Lebanon are technically still at war, their armies still meet on a regular basis under the auspices of UNIFIL in order to discuss border security. Israel believes the construction of this concrete wall is going to put an end to so-called border frictions from Lebanese villages like these. Last year on the commemoration of Nakba and Naksa days, Lebanese residents tried to approach the Israeli-Lebanese border. Now with the Israeli army announcing that the construction of this wall would be complete within a few weeks, it may very well be ready ahead of Nakba day on May the 15th. Apart from this concrete wall, already in place is a highly fortified electric fence along the entire border between Israel and Lebanon. With rising tensions and turmoil in the Middle East, we've repeatedly heard statements from Israeli officials saying additional measures must be taken on the ground to beef up Israel's border security. So the question is, does this latest Israeli wall mean protection or further isolation? Let's bring in our guests for today to talk this through in Beirut. First of all, Hisham Jabber, a former Lebanese military general, also a military and defense analyst heading up the Middle East Center for Studies and Research. That's in Beirut. Two guests from Tel Aviv as well. First is Gideon Levy. He is the columnist for the Haaretz newspaper, a member of its editorial board. Uh, Mr. Levy's also written a book called The Punishment of Gaza. And we've got Greg Roman as well. He's deputy director at the uh, Gloria Center at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. This is another uh, think tank. Mr. Roman, uh, also a former political advisor in the Knesset and an official at the Israeli Ministry of Defense. So three excellent minds to talk us through a very interesting issue. Gideon Levy, let me start with you first of all. I want to actually stay away for a moment from the idea of rights and wrongs and protection versus isolation and just the idea that is this all legitimate? Is Israel building a wall on its land and it's allowed to do that? No, no doubt it is legitimate. I mean, any country is sovereign to build any anything on its own sovereign land and about the border with Lebanon, there is no question about the sovereignty. The question is not uh, the legal question, the question is not the sovereignty question. The question is, does really Israel wants to become a castle uh, surrounded by fences all over? Is this the only answer? Is this an answer to the future? But I guess we'll get into it uh, later the discussion. No, well, that's good. That's a good start. Nice brief start. I might just throw the same sort of question to Hisham Jabber over there. Uh, in Beirut. Again, the idea that this is, uh, I mean, you can question it as much as you want. And 
I wonder, are the Lebanese questioning or are they agreeing that this can actually be allowed to happen even if they don't necessarily like it? Yes, sir. The problem is not uh, the wall by itself. The problem is where the wall, il, it will be uh, the emplacement of the wall. Mm. If Israel will uh, uh, build up the wall and its land, I don't think Lebanon has any problem with this or ha have any uh, reason to protest against it. Uh, Israeli pretend that this wall is to protect their citizen in Al Mutalla village against snipers. Uh, in my opinion, no one single incident happened or any sniper from the Lebanese land did shot on the Israeli land on the last six years. Uh, I think that Israel want to build up this uh, wall uh, to, pro to forbid any uh, move or any infiltration from the Lebanese land uh, to uh, Israel. Uh, especially if you remember that uh, uh, Sayyid Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, said mm. a few years ago, made it clear that in case of any war against Israel, the war will be inside Israel. That means the fighters of Hezbollah, uh, they will move from the Lebanese land. I think that area from uh, uh, the gate of Fatima until Adaisi, uh, it's uh, one of the easiest places. There is a fence, but you can move easily from the Lebanese land to the Israeli land. Uh, Israel, in my opinion, in a military point of view, doesn't need uh, uh, this war at uh, all. Okay. On the, uh, this war, uh, this war is not, uh, you know, uh, it's not uh, necessary and will not give the feedback of if they are talking about protection or not protection against mm -hmm. snipers because the the city or the village of Kfarkila and the other highest places in Lebanon along this uh, wall from the Lebanese side dominate, you know, uh, the the plain of al Hula, uh, starting from Kfarkila, the village, to a high uh, calling uh, called al Hamamis, and uh, you have to arrive to Adaisi. And if this wall is not five meters, if even if it is 10 meters, if you go back and high on the Lebanese land, you can control and dominate okay. El Hula uh, so plain and uh, yeah, in that village called Al Mutallah. Right. So both. And both th sorry, let me interrupt you for a moment, Mr. Mr. Hisham. Both Hisham Jabra and Gideon Levy have raised the idea of necessity. Greg Roman, I'd like to ask you about that. Basically, the question, is this really necessary? Is a six metre wall, a 10 metre wall, whatever you want to make, is it going to do the job? Well, contrary to the previous speaker's remarks, there was an unprovoked sniper attack by the Lebanese Armed Forces a year and a half ago that essentially murdered an IDF lieutenant colonel. Afterwards, there was a subsequent exchange of fire, and then a uh, ceasefire was reached by the intervention of UNIFIL, the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon. In August of 2011, we saw another cross-border exchange of fire provoked by the Lebanese army again. So whether there's a need and a necessity for this barrier, the answer would be yes, because there has been attacks from the Lebanese side onto the Israeli side since UN Resolution 1501, which called for a ceasefire at the end of the Second Lebanon War. Now, in terms of its ability to protect Israeli citizens, I, I do think it'll do the job in this one specific area. We're not talking about the entire border. We're talking about reinforcing an area by Kafar Kila, where we have seen two incidents in the last three months alone. So if you're talking about the effectiveness of a security barrier being built, we saw the same situation between Bethlehem and Jerusalem when Palestinian terrorists from the Hamas Islamic Jihad and Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade were using the minarets and mosques to snipe down on Israeli civilian populaces on the uh, other side of the Green Line with Israel. And we saw many Israeli citizens murdered and also injured. And we saw a 90% reduction in the amount of attacks, and specifically in this case, sniper attacks that were able to be carried out. And this was about seven years ago. So now when we go to the instance of Hezbollah using tactics, as the previous speaker had said, and them declaring openly with Hassan Nasrallah, declaring that he will send Hezbollah fighters into Israel in the event of a next conflict, 
First of all, I think that's highly unlikely considered the IDF's defense positioning on the border. And now it will be even more unlikely because of the fact that Israel is protecting its citizens by building this barrier and a proven effective solution in the wake of ongoing sniper fire by Lebanese forces. Okay, proven effective decision. Gideon Levy, I'm going to bring you back in here because uh, I think Greg Roman has made a good argument here and said, you know, if you compare it to the other wall, which we of course know in the West Bank, that at least from the Israeli perspective, it did work. It brought down the number of attacks in Israel. Uh, and this would, by their thinking, do the same thing again. First of all, there is a big uh, difference between the wall uh, in the West Bank and the wall uh, with Lebanon. Uh, the wall in the West Bank was uh, mainly built on Palestinian lands. Uh, in the areas which were occupied in 67 and uh, none of us would have said a word I guess if uh, the wall would have been built on the green line on the 67 mm. border okay. but no, I'm just talking about the effect to of this Mr. Levy, just whether it worked or not because we're going to come into that wall. later yeah yeah sure no doubt it had an effect and no doubt it was not the only barrier for terror coming into Israel because as uh, any Israeli knows and any Palestinian knows, there are still many holes in the wall in the West Bank and still terrorists are not coming in. Terror stopped because of many reasons, not only because of the wall. No doubt the wall was one of the factors to, to stop terror. And again, the question is, what is Israel doing with uh, this uh, uh, interval in terror? Uh, building more walls will not lead Israel anywhere. Yeah, this is a good point, the fact that it is effectively walling itself in. Um, Hisham Jabber, sorry, let me come back to you in Beirut there. Could this actually make sense for the Lebanese in one way or another? If Israel does want to wall itself in in this way, shut itself off at the north at the very least, let it, if it wants to. It might, be, might, might, might work in the Lebanese favour. Uh, as we said, that uh, Lebanon uh, doesn't have any problem if this wall is uh, built on the Israeli land. But if it will move a few centimeters, that means Israel is extending this war and taken from the Lebanese land. We have bad experience with Israel. Israel did take a thousand of acres uh, after its occupation uh, within 22 years in Lebanon between 1978 and 2000. After the liberation, we came back with uh, a blue line of Ted Larry Larson, which is not at all the international borders between Israel and Lebanon. Israel did took uh, uh, thousands of acres from the Lebanese land. At that time, Lebanon did accept the blue line in order to avoid any uh, any uh, clash uh, between uh, Lebanon and Israel. And going back to this war, in my opinion, is not effective at all because it's only about one kilometer or 1.5 kilometers. What about the other side, the other borders? Mm -hmm. We have 150 kilometers between Lebanon and Israel. Uh, let's go back on the left to Marun Ras. Marun Ras do, does dominate the whole uh, plain of Al Hula and dominate a lot of Israeli villages. Is Israel is going to also to build up uh, 50 meters high, for example, to avoid the domination of Marun Ras. And let's go to the other point on the borders. Uh, of course, after Adaisi, we have Hula, Markaba, and Maisel Jabal. Maybe the level of the land is equivalent. Uh, there is no domination from any side. But also, if you go uh, along the Lebanese borders, you find any other points. You know, I don't think Israel will build up uh, a wall of 150 kilometers. Uh, and uh, talking about this wall, Lebanon has made it clear and with the coordination of the UNIFIL and Lebanon sent uh, expert and topograph mm -hmm. to see if this wall will be built up on the Lebanese land or on the Israeli land. If it's on the Israeli land, I don't think Lebanon has any reason to protect uh, protest against it. Okay. And we have to wait. And it's very sensitive. It will take maybe three weeks and we will see to avoid any conflict. Right, but uh, General, before, before I bring Greg Roman back into the conversation, I do want to just widen it out just for a moment and talk about basically some other walls because Israel's newest 
wall, the one we're talking about, does follow the construction or planned construction of four others, which could eventually see, really, Israel completely enclosed by steel, concrete and barbed wire. Have a look at the map here. The most famous and controversial, it is the 748-kilometre separation wall encircling the West Bank, the red line on your map. We've already talked about this. Israel says it's a necessary security measure, that it has deterred attacks from the Palestinian territories. Uh, but as Gideon Levy pointed out, given it runs inside the Green Line, uh, which marks out Israeli and Palestinian territory, many just see it as an annexation of Palestinian land. That's the biggest dot. Then you've got the blue line just there around Gaza, you see. 51-kilometre wall around the Strip, succeeded in keeping Palestinians in, but hasn't really stopped the rockets being fired out into Israel. Add another one, it'll adjoin actually, that orange line now, a new wall, uh, which Israel's building along its 241-kilometre western border with Egypt. Due for completion at the end of the year, Israel says it's a necessary deterrent against terrorism and illegal infiltration. And there's one more. It was announced by the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu back in January. We put up along the border with Jordan, a move intended to curb migrant workers from entering Israel. Greg Roman in Tel Aviv. I'm sure you'll want to answer what some of our guests have previously said, but I just want to talk about this, first of all, this idea of current walls and, and more walls. Anyone who looks at that map and those ideas will look at it and think, well, yeah, Israel is basically locking itself in. And does that indicate less cooperation with its neighbours in a region where they've got to talk, they've got to find a way through all of this at some point. No, Israeli isolation with its Arab neighbors started in 1967 in Khartoum with the three no's. No negotiations, no recognition, and no talking to the Jewish state. However, there's a saying that goes that good fences make good neighbors. In fact, <laughs> UNIFIL and the commander asked in the summer of 2011 for suggestions from the Israeli Eben the Lebanese army of how they may be able to de-escalate tensions in the wake of the attacks that I previously spoke of. But the reason why these barriers are being created and why they eventually actually might come one down one day is because of security threats that emanate from Lebanon, from Syria, from Jordan and from Egypt. Last year, we saw nine Israeli citizens massacred by, by terrorists who were attacking from the Sinai Peninsula in the Eilat area. In the Jordan area, we see thousands of African migrants now coming into the country, or the likeliness of thousands of African migrants, should the Sinai barrier be completed, they will use Aqaba as a transition point as opposed to the Sinai Peninsula. Along the Syrian border, we see massive provocations in the instance of the what they called Nakba Day last year, when we saw a wave of Syrian and Palestinian migrants coming across the border to create a security threat situation and violate Israel's sovereignty. And then now the case of Lebanon, we see, as the previous speaker had said, Hassan Nasrallah openly threatening to attack Israel. So it, this perception of Israel boxing itself in is the wrong paradigm in how to look at this. But you say it's a passive given the defense paradigm... measure which is used in order to minimize conflict. Forgive me interrupting. You, that, parent, that, that example you gave of good it's friends make to good neighbors. It's not ignore its neighbors. I apologize. Sorry, right. good friends make good neighbors. Right. I'm still trying to get my head around that one for this particular situation. No, good, 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 fe good, good, sorry, good fences fe make good neighbors. Okay, well, explain that a bit more in this situation because you've just described people who aren't being very neighborly. Right, and the reason why they're not being neighborly is because they have the opportunity to be able to send terrorists to take out attacks on Israeli land. The whole reason why the operation started in the 70s with the initial uh, incursion of Israel into Lebanon was because of the Dalal Mugrabi coastal road massacre, which was because that there was no way for the Israeli forces to monitor what was going on at its border, in this case, the sea. So what we think in the Israeli defensive analysis, or at least the reason why they're building these perimeter defenses and barriers, is because if they can minimize the opportunities for terrorists to be able to use open areas in the border, and Gideon Levy mentioned the open areas in the West Bank along the security fence there, and I would like to say to him that they're right now building and trying to complete the rest of the border, but essentially, if we're able to minimize opportunities for terrorists to commit cross-border attacks, it may lead to a decrease in the tensions that are going on between Israel and its neighbors, therefore allowing us to move forward without all the threats of that, you know, essentially make peace a very hard situation, an untenable situation to achieve right now. And in doing so, maybe by having this kind of de-escalation, we'll be able to speak to our neighbors without having so many threats. Gideon Levy, your thoughts on that? Can this all actually be positive in the end? It's very typical to uh, right-wingers in Israel and propagandists to speak only about the dangers, to frighten us with all kinds of dangers. Some of them are real dangers, some of them are exaggerated dangers. 
and never ask why, and never ask what are we going to do in order to minimize those dangers, in order to get to any solution except of building more fences and arming ourselves with more arms and, and developing more and more weapons. Finally, it's about Israel to be accepted in the Middle East or not to be accepted in the Middle East. And in a very, very irrational way, Israel is doing anything possible in the last decades not to be accepted in the Middle East. And then to complain about all the dangers and all the, the risks and then to cover itself and surround itself with, with walls. Again, I say I have nothing against walls. But Israel should open up to the Middle East. And the first steps should have been long time ago to put an end to the occupation. But, you know, the occupation is almost not uh, mentioned here as if the occupation is, you know, a force majeure and everyone accepts it. And now let's face the dangers which have a lot to do with the occupation. I don't say that the occupation is the only reason why Israel is threatened, mm. but it's the main reason why Israel is threatened. And we didn't hear anything about putting, first of all, an end to the occupation, which is the main motivation for all those horrible dangers, part of them real ones, and part of them totally exaggerated ones. Hashim Jabber, from the Lebanese perspective, can any good come of all of this, do you think? Gideon Levy was saying, you know, walls, it's, it's not the worst idea in the world, but opening up and talking would be so much more effective. Uh, let me tell you something. Uh, I do not agree with your guest when he said this wall will minimize the risk against Israel, and especially uh, snipers and, uh, you know, terrorism, what he called it, that I don't think one and a half kilometer will uh, minimize that risk. What about uh, 150 kilometers. Second, I do agree that uh, this area is very sensitive because it's very close to Israel and the borders are very close and there is a Lebanese road. I do agree that maybe uh, we had many demonstrations, you know, in many occasions on that, on the gate of Fatima, which Israel considered this uh, all the time as uh, an aggressive movement and they did make alert, you know, against it. Maybe this wall will avoid against such uh, demonstrations. But if you do remember when he said, he talked about the conflict between the Lebanese army and Israel two years ago in that area. Uh, that time Israel moved into the Lebanese land and tried to take off some trees in order to ensure observation, you know, toward the Lebanese land. Uh, my question is, is this wall will ensure observation uh, to Israel? I don't think so. The opposite will happen. Mm. And at that time, Lebanese army did uh, execute its own, its uh, normal and legal duty to protect its land. Right, uh, Mr. Hisham, I've only got a short amount of time left, so I'm going to interrupt you because I'd like to go back to Greg Roman just quickly because, Greg, you gave me a nice metaphor really about the good fences, wasn't it? The fences and the neighbours. I've got one for you here. The idea that in totality this whole Israeli situation is almost like a turtle going into its shell and hiding. It feels threatened by people around it so it's going in in a protectionist mode. If that's the case, how long can a country in this region realistically do that before things actually get even worse? Well, I think that it's not just that the IDF is protecting its citizens and creating the infrastructure necessary for protecting its citizens, but every time the Israeli political leadership reaches out to its neighbors, it's met with a stone wall by the Arabs' own uh, intransigence in trying to not want to negotiate with us. I mean, we have been looking for a Lebanese, a Syrian, leader which may be willing to meet, make peace with Israel. The last time we were able to meet someone in Pierre Gemayel, he was assassinated by other Arab extremists who didn't want to have peace with the Israeli country. So I think that it's Israel taking the necessary measures of minimizing risk to its own population. And on the other hand, in every diplomatic forum that it's president and every political statement that it makes, it welcomes negotiations with its neighbors. So on one hand, it has to protect itself by having a big stick. But on the other, the carrot that they offer in negotiations is never accepted by the Arab leadership on the other side. 
So this is the situation that mm -hmm. will continue existing this way and Israel will continue to be the military power in the Middle East until its neighbors are ready to talk with it. And I guarantee you any political leader in Israel would be willing to discuss peace with the Lebanese leadership, with the Syrian leadership and with the Palestinian leadership. Gentlemen, we've talked for 20 minutes or so. I don't think we've sold anything, but we've heard every side of the argument. And for that, I do thank you, Gideon Levy in Tel Aviv, uh, Hisham Jabbar in Beirut, and also Greg Roman in Tel Aviv. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. And to you, our viewers, thank you for joining us for Inside Story. Uh, if you've got a comment on this show or a future show, got an idea for us, send it in. Inside Story at aljazeera.net is our email address. I'm Kamal Santamaria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye. For now.